right, well, we're continuing the uh, Living the Kingdom series where we're going through the Sermon on the Mount. And we've made it through a lot of stuff, and we're now in chapter 7, which means we're coming up on the conclusion. These are the last few things that Jesus says, and it's going to take us a few weeks to get through all of it. Uh, we're going to cover chapter 7, verses 1 through 6 today. Now, what we need to understand about this passage before we even get into it is this is, I, I would vote for it to be the most misused passage of Scripture in the Sermon on the Mount, okay? Uh, so I'm just going to say that out the gate, that I'm, I may have to challenge you on what you might think on this passage, and it's going to be good for all of us, okay? Being challenged is good. Um, <clears throat> so if you, you, all of us are familiar with this passage, and that's part of the problem. We think we know what it means because we've heard it so much. You know, if you hear something a long time, you kind of think you understand it. Um, but let's remember, we're reading the Bible in English. It's been translated from Greek, and it was written 2,000 years ago in a completely different culture. So there's a good chance that our definition of certain words is not the same as the definition that Matthew intended when he wrote this down. He heard Jesus say it, and he wrote it down. Um, so what we need to do is we need to make sure we are understanding this the way Matthew intended for us to understand it because he's telling us how he understood what Jesus said. So think about it this way. Jesus was most, li most likely speaking in Aramaic. Matthew wrote it down in Greek, and now we're reading it in English. Good chance we might have missed something in that transition, right? Okay, so this is, like I said, this is the most misused passage. Not so much in the church world, but it's pretty bad there too. Uh, but definitely in the secular world, people quote Jesus in this passage all the time, and they're getting it way wrong, okay? So this is something we're familiar with. Let's, let's just deal with it. We'll deal honestly with it, and we're going to just talk through some things that are going to be good. Some things are going to be a little difficult uh, for us to swallow. It's just part of it. It's the Bible, and it's Jesus. He's the divine Word of God who made everything, and he came down here to give his life to tell us the truth. That's good, right? Thank God that he did that. <laughs> All right? Okay, well, let's just dig in, and we'll, we'll see how this goes. So get your tomatoes ready, right? <laughs> no, it's going to be good. I'm just kidding. Ready? All right, you've heard this before, right? Jesus said, judge not that you be not judged, for with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged, and with the measure you use it, it will be measured to you. You heard this quoted a lot, right? This is usually most often quoted when someone is being criticized. And they say, well, Jesus said you can't judge me. Isn't that what we say a lot, right? Well, you can't judge me. Jesus said you can't judge. And in English, it kind of looks like that's what he's saying. The only problem is our definition of judge and the biblical definition that's used here is different, okay? So how do we normally think about this? We normally think that when Jesus says, don't judge, what we American, Western, modern people think is that to judge someone means to disagree with them, or it means you're telling them they did something wrong. What you're doing is wrong. Well, you can't judge me. That's our definition of judge. Does that make sense? That's about, that's about right, isn't it? That's how we commonly use this term. Well, you can't judge me because you're telling me I did something wrong and that's judging me. Or you're telling me I'm wrong about what I think about something and that's judging me. You can't do that. That is not what Jesus means when he uses this word. The word family that the word judge is translated from, in the Greek, it's the word krenete here, and sometimes it's krino. And uh, this word family, krenete, krino, uh, it means to condemn. It doesn't mean, it, Jesus is not saying, nobody heard in the original audience at the Sermon on the Mount, nobody heard Jesus say, don't criticize, or you'll be criticized. And he didn't say, don't tell someone that you need, or don't correct someone's behavior, or your behavior will be corrected. Nobody heard that. Here's what those people heard 
in their own terms, in their own language. Condemn not, or you will be condemned. What does this word mean? This word krino or krinathe, it means to make a final conclusive declaration. So it would be like if you're thinking in a courtroom, when the judge says guilty and he passes a sentence, this is the final thing before they send you off to do your sentence, right? Jesus is saying, don't jump to that end. Or we'll jump to that end with you. So let's, let's try to think about this the way Jesus wanted to communicate it, all right? He's saying, when you look at someone's behavior, or you look at what someone thinks or what their opinion is, don't make a final decision about who that person is based on a behavior or an opinion. Don't make a final decision and label that person a certain thing just because you're looking at a very little set of things they might be doing. Now, let me give you some examples. This will kind of help make sense. We say things in the church world like this. Well, I don't think they're a Christian because they did fill in the blank, right? Not, not literally, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> Rhetorical here. Um, so I, I don't think they're really a Christian because they did this thing. See, that's making a final judgment on someone, and you're assuming that you have all the right information to make that judgment, right? That's a final condemnation, okay? Now, you might be able to look at someone's behavior and say, that's not like Jesus. That's not what Jesus wants for us. Maybe we should step in and help this person. That's different than saying, well, that person's not a Christian, so off with their head, so to speak. <laughs> do, you, do you get what I'm saying? We do, we do this in the, in the church world all the time. The secular world does it too. They just do it in your direction. So they look at you and say, well, you say you follow Jesus, but you still did this sin that I saw you do. Therefore, you're a hypocrite and you're not, you don't really believe what you say you believe. So they do it the same way. They label you. And they say, you're not real or authentic because you still have issues in your life. And then we look at, at <laughs> we most commonly look at each other within the church and say, well, I don't think they're really in the faith because look what they did. Jesus is saying, don't make a final decision about someone. Don't condemn people. Now, I wonder why he would say that. Well, there's a few reasons. First of all, that's not your job. You, we don't get to condemn people, right? I mean, and it, and it doesn't work anyway. You don't get to decide someone's eternal destiny, do you? Thank God you don't. <laughs> Half the people you know would go to hell, right? Because <laughs> you're so loving, right? So um, it's a good thing that we don't get to decide that. It's not our job. Whose job is it? Who gets to be the judge on judgment day? The Father, the, the Godhead, Jesus. They get to judge who's in and out by their own criteria, not by ours. And so if we don't create the criteria by which we will ju be judged, and we aren't the judge who gets to decide whether it's condemnation or eternal life, if neither of those are our job, Jesus is saying, stop taking my job. Make sense? So judge not does not mean uh, don't correct someone's behavior. It's not don't, don't disagree with anyone. Don't try to rescue someone from their sin. He's not saying any of those things. He's saying condemn not. Because if you live like you're the judge, you'll be judged the same way you're judging people. Make sense? So we use these kind of things all the time. We might label someone a bad person because of something we saw them do or heard about them doing. We'll say things like, you know, people who do this certain sin, they definitely go to hell. That's condemnation. We're assuming we know the intricate 
uh, things of someone's heart, all of which you can't see, right? But who does see the heart? The judge. He can see the heart. That's why it's his job to decide. And he says, look, for with the, I'm I'm just going to read it from what the Greek actually says. Okay, so verse 2 here says, for with the condemnation you condemn people with. That word pronounced, it's the same Crino word family. So it's like, if you're reading this in Greek, it kind of says, for with the Crino you Crino, <laughs> right? It's just using the, the, the noun and the verb form over and over again. So it's the same word. So with the condemnation that you condemn people with, you will be condemned. So how you condemn people is how you end up being condemned. And, and this kind of works this way, not in an eternal sense. Obviously, that's true there too. But it works in everyday life the same way. If you walk around condemning everybody and you have a reputation of condemning everybody, what, is, what do people think about you? Well, they pretty much condemn you too. They will condemn you back, right? Right? Because, I mean, who likes a person like that? Who wants to be around a person like that? So he says, whatever you do, you, you are going to reap what you have sown, right? You plant apple seeds, you get apples. You plant condemnation seeds, you get condemnation fruit. Yes, okay. And he says, and with the measure you use it, it will be measured to you. Now, the word here uh, for measure is metron in Greek. Um, And it it refers to the standard by which things are measured. So if you think about uh, a tape measure, right? We've all seen one of those, right? Whether you know how to read one or not, that's another discussion, right? (laughs) If you're my age and younger, you probably never were taught to read one. But let's just imagine a tape measure. The tape measure is telling you the standard of how things are measured, right? Right? So if you're looking at a tape measure that's got inches on it, then that is the standard by which you tell how long something or how short something is. He says, Jesus is saying, the standard that you're using, the ruler you use to size up people, that'll be the same ruler I'll use for you. Anybody want to do that? You, do you want Jesus to decide your fate <laughs> by how you decided other people's? No, I don't. Now, here, here's what we do. You know, us Christians, we're so godly. <laughs> we want justice for everybody else. And we want grace for us. Isn't that how we are? Let's just all be honest now. We're all this way. If somebody does something that we think is awful and we think they should have to pay for that. But then when you do something awful, you want grace and mercy and forgiveness and understanding and people to pray for you. Right? Do we need to raise hands in here? I'll go first. Right? That's how we, that's how we are by our fallen sinful nature. We want justice for everybody else and grace for me. Right? Jesus says that's not how this works. Here's how it works. How you treat everybody else is how I'm going to treat you. You reap what you sow. Wow. The standard you use for other people, I'll use your own standard against you. That's tough words. See, people listening to Jesus just heard him talk about, don't worry about your life. Just seek the kingdom, I'll take care of you. And they're all like, man, this Jesus guy, man, he's got good teaching. And then he says, now, let's talk about this. Quit condemning people or I'll condemn you. And if whatever standard you're using to condemn everybody else, I'll use that standard that you created against you. I mean, at this point in the sermon, it's like, oh, man, the restaurant's going to be full. We better, we better leave early, you know. We'll stop on that worry thing. That was a good one, Jesus. Can we go backwards in the sermon? Right? Let's save that. Let's make this a series, Jesus. Let's save that one for next week. Right? So it got tough right here at the end, didn't he? And he's going to stay that way all the way to the end of the sermon. 
So that's what you got to look forward to the next few weeks. We're going to cover some difficult stuff. But we need it. Amen? We, we need to get our feelings hurt. I know in the world we live in right now, it's like, a, it's like the unforgivable sin to get your feelings hurt. That's the problem is we're not willing to get our feelings hurt. Right? You with me? Good. All right, let's continue to read. Let's, let's get our feelings hurt a little more. Sound good? <laughs> okay, now, <clears throat> he says, now why, I got a question for you. Why do you see the speck that's in your brother's eye? Now, let's just stop right there. You know what's coming, the whole log in your eye thing. Let's just stop right there, though. He said, why do you see the speck in your brother's eye? That's a profound enough question without talking about the log in your own eye. Jesus says, why did you even notice a speck in someone's eyeball? Think about the, this is, Jesus loves to do this. He likes to take an illustration and take it to the extreme, right? So, well, here's what he's saying. Look, you're, you're looking around condemning people. Why do you even notice what's wrong with them? Hmm. And you notice so much to the point that you're willing to pass judgment or sentence on them. Why did you even see that speck in their eye again? Why were you looking that hard? I mean, think about, what, think about this illustration he's using. It would be like me walking right up to you and getting this close to your face and saying, there's a speck in your eye. You, first of all, you probably wouldn't even let me get that close, right? I mean, my wife would back up. What are you doing? <laughs> right? I mean, why would you be that close to somebody to see a speck? The word here for speck is, is the word for a sawdust particle. Jesus grew up in a carpenter's home. This is a great illustration for him. A sawdust particle. Now, let me tell you what happens when you get sawdust in your eye. You ever had sawdust in your eye? You don't ever build anything, right? Uh, this has happened to me, the few things that I have built, and yes, all of them are still standing. I did a good job, okay? Um, but I, I've got sawdust in my eye before more than once. You cannot find that thing in your eye. One, it's very light colored, you know, wood when it's dried out to be used for building. Uh, it's very light, it's, it's almost white, and it's in your white eyeball, right? You can't hardly find that. You just have to keep rinsing your eye out until you notice, you blink around, like, okay, I think it's out now. But you can't find that speck. Jesus says, he's using this to say, you are paying too much attention to other people if you're noticing everything about their life. Why do you see a speck in their eye? How did you find it? That's what he's saying. That's what people were hearing when he was saying this. Why do you even see the speck? And if that's not enough, why do you see a speck, um, but, but you didn't even pay close enough attention, is what the Greek says. The word for notice is to pay careful attention. So, so you know, why did you see that speck and, and you didn't even notice that you had a tree Sticking out of your face? It says log here. The word is timber for building buildings. Like this would be the post you would put in the ground to be the main support poles of a building. Or they would be the rafters. They would use a whole tree for the rafters on a roof to support the roof. Because they didn't have light materials to put on a roof. Their roof was pretty heavy. It had a lot of mud and stuff on it. So they would use trees to support the roof. So, so let's just imagine, see this big post right here in the middle? Okay, that's a small version of what Jesus is talking about. And he says, how, how did, why did you see a speck of sawdust in your brother's eye, but you missed a tree coming out of your face? Now let's just think about what that means. He's, and he says, look, how can you say to your brother, hey, let me help you with that, that sawdust? You got, some, you got a little thing there in your eye. Let me help you with that. When there is a tree in your own eye. <laughs> now, let's think about this had to be 
It, it's meant to hurt your feelings, and I think it's meant to make you laugh at yourself. Jesus was funny. Yes? Right? Swallow a camel, strain out a gnat. That's funny. Okay? He said that to religious people, by the way, who probably didn't like this passage at all. Right? So he says, look, if you're trying to help someone with sawdust in their eye, but you have a tree coming out of your face, don't you think you're going to hurt that person rather than help them? I mean, just imagine. I, mean, I would love to illustrate this. I couldn't figure out how to get a tree strapped to my head without hurting myself. But just imagine you have a huge, we, we won't even go tree. We'll just say a fence post sticking out of your face. And you need to walk up to somebody close enough to get something out of their eye. What's going to happen? You're going to knock the person out. It's going to injure them, right? And you too, right? That's what Jesus is saying. It, here's, let me just translate. Okay, in Greek, this passage means you're being stupid. <laughs> Stupido, right? <laughs> That's what he's saying. He's like, look, how, how in the world do you think you can help someone else you got a tree coming out your face. You're just going to hurt everybody. Everywhere you look to see more sawdust, bam, you're hitting somebody in the head. That's the word, that's the picture you're supposed to have in your head. <laughs> so I guess the, the answer is stop doing that. Stop, stop noticing all the specks in everybody's eye. We see this all the time in the church world, don't we? And it's not just in the church world. The, the secular world has it too. I mean, when you, when you turn on the news, everybody's nitpicking each other's sawdust. Right? We're supposed to be not doing that. But we, we kind of become famous for nitpicking sawdust. Right? Well, I don't know if they're a Christian. Do you hear, what they, do you hear that word they said? You know that those those words that we label cuss words that aren't in your Bible anywhere? We worry about stuff like that. Oh, did you hear did you see them at the Mexican restaurant? Did you see what they had on their table? I don't think they're a Christian. We do this to people while ignoring our own trees of sins we have sticking out of our faces. We're sweating the small stuff when we got bigger things to worry about. Yes? Okay. He says, look, you hypocrite. <laughs> First, take the tree out of your own head, out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Oh, wait. Um... We're supposed to be helping people with their sin. He just said you've got your process backwards. You're walking around with trees coming out of your face, injuring everybody because you think you can see something in their eye. Really, you can't see at all. You've got trees in your eyes, and you're injuring everybody, and you're not even seeing clearly. You're not actually perceiving the right thing in that person because of what's in your own eye. See what he's doing? And he says, look... Take the tree out of your head first. Then you can help someone with their sawdust. What's it, doesn't that imply we're supposed to be helping each other out of our sin? Yes. But isn't this the passage everybody goes to when you try to correct, correct someone's behavior? They jump to this passage and go, Jesus said you can't judge me. No, actually he said I'm supposed to deal with my own stuff first and then I'm supposed to help you get out of your stuff so you don't end up in destruction see this passage is not saying don't correct anyone this passage is not it, it, here's what he's saying here there's a process to go through before you make a final decision about somebody that process is found in Matthew 18 
and this is all in your notes. I'm, I'm skipping over a lot of stuff because I got a nine hour drive in a few minutes, okay? Um, but there's plenty of stuff in there for you to go read. Go read Matthew 18. Jesus describes exactly what to do with someone who is in sin. He says, you are supposed to go to them one to one. That's the first thing you do. You don't have a prayer meeting about the person where you involve other people first. You go to them individually. And if they say, I don't care what you say, I refuse to repent, you can't judge me, whatever, then you come back with two or more people. And you beg this person to repent. Not because you want to be right, but because you want them not to run their life off a cliff. We love people enough to try to rescue them. I'm going to read you some passages in a minute to help us understand that. We're trying to rescue them. And if they don't listen to those two or three people either and say, I'm going to do what I want to do, leave me alone. And Jesus says, you tell the church. And if they won't even listen to their church family and they continue, you're supposed to treat them as if they're an unbeliever. Wow. We don't hear that sermon preached too often, do we? But I wonder how many people wouldn't wreck their lives because we jumped in and tried to rescue them instead of just standing back and saying, well, you know, I heard. I heard this was going on. I heard this was going on. That's crazy. He must not be a Christian. She must not be a Christian. They've, they've, They've went off the deep end. Sure glad I'm not in that messed up. And that's what we do, and we just watch people wreck their lives. I wonder how many times we're going to be told in heaven on judgment day when we're actually having to answer for things. I wonder how many times Jesus is going to have to say, you know, you were in a church family with that person, and you watched them wreck their life, and you said nothing. You did nothing, and it was your responsibility. That was your brother. That was your sister, and you did nothing. So in this teaching, he says, we're supposed to help each other out, but you need to be dealing with your own stuff too. Because if you're not, you're not seeing their stuff clearly. You've got it muddied up. And um, just in case you're wondering, okay, does it, is there more passages where we're supposed to be doing this? Well, here's what Paul wrote to the Corinthian church. Now, if you've never read Corinthians, I call it Christianity Gone Wild. Because that's essentially what Corinthians, the Corinthian church was in. He writes them two letters. We actually know he wrote more than two letters. We just don't have the others. Um, but anyway, in chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians, Paul has found out that in this church, let's see, we got kids in here, uh, <clears throat> there was a guy who had his father's wife. Does that make enough sense for us adults? (laughs) A man has his father's wife. Now, so that's either his mom or his stepmom. And the church was celebrating this relationship. So Paul writes to him, writes to that church and says, you guys are crazy. You should not be celebrating this behavior. You should be dealing with this behavior in a way that rescues this person out of their sin, or at least cuts them loose to to go destroy themselves, but quit destroying the church. That's what he tells the Corinthians. And at the end of that, he says, because he essentially tells them, look, these people shouldn't be in your church if they refuse to repent of this, because they're not being Christians. That's what he tells the Corinthian church. And at the end of it, he says, look, now I'm not saying to go around judging and condemning outsiders. What business have I to do with judging outsiders, he says. Is it not those those inside the church whom you are to judge? Oh. Well, Paul, didn't you read Jesus' Sermon on the Mount? He said, judge not. 
But apparently Paul was not reading that the way Americans read it. He says you are supposed to judge each other within the church. Interesting. But it's for the purpose of restoration. It's a rescue mission, not a condemnation mission. Yes? He goes on, uh, James says this. This is Jesus' brother. He says, my brothers, if any of you uh, among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that he, that whoever brings, him, brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. That covering sin, that's atonement language from the Old Testament. James is a full-blooded Jew. He knows his Old Testament. He says, look, if, if somebody within your group they wander from the truth, meaning they're living in deception. They're living a lie. They're lying to themselves and someone else. They've wandered from the truth. Make sense? He says, if someone does that, he's assuming that's going to happen in your church because it will. Somebody's always wandering from the truth. <clears throat> he says, and one of you brings him back. I want you to understand what you did. You rescued their soul from death. That's ultimate destruction. And you can cover over a multitude of sins. Isn't that good? So, so we're responsible. I, wait a minute. I thought Jesus was going to do all that. I thought Jesus was going to save our soul from death and cover over sin. Well, he does. But then he called us, his children, his family, and he expects us to operate like a family. I mean, parents, if your kid was headed off of a cliff, wouldn't you correct that behavior? Well, you're just, you're just judgmental. That's your problem. You can't go around just judging your kids like that. Maybe they felt like it was the right thing for their life. Maybe they wanted to be adventurous. See, that sounds dumb to us as parents. Now, let me ask you a tougher question. Why don't we love each other in our church family like we love our kids? Why aren't we willing to go have a hard conversation with somebody and say, you know what, I'm not condemning you. But you're on your way to condemning yourself. If you don't stop this, it's going to destroy you. And I love you enough to come say, I'm willing to help you get out of this. See, when we go, when we go do this process with someone, you're not just going and preaching at them and then leaving. James assumes you're going to be involved in bringing the person back in away from the deception and sin, and back into righteousness and family. Yes? He's assuming you're going to be that part of that process. You're not just going to go, you're wrong, and you better get it straight, or don't come back. I'll be back with two or three people. <laughs> That's not how you're supposed to do this. You're supposed to go to them and say, gosh, I... I've been where you're at, or I've been in a similar situation, and I'm telling you, you're going to destruction, and I don't want you to go there. I don't want your family to be in that. Let me help you get out of this. If you stop and repent now, you could cover over a multitude of sins that you're on your way to committing. Well, you don't have to do that to you. You don't Stop hitting yourself, <laughs> right? We don't have to do this. That's what we do with people, because Paul also wrote in Romans that it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. Right? Isn't that how he got you? Something happened, some experience you have where it just became very clear that God loves you more than you ever thought he did. And he wants to save you and forgive you and cover over a multitude of sins and rescue you from death. You became aware of that in a new way, and it was that kindness of God 
of what he feels for you that got you into this to begin with? That's exactly how we ought to go to people who are wandering from the truth. With kindness. Hey, I don't, I'm not condemning you. But you're on your way to destruction and I don't want to see that happen. And then Jesus ends with this really strange statement. Don't give to dogs what is holy, and don't throw your pearls before pigs, lest they trample them underfoot and turn and attack you. Huh? (laughs) Right? I mean, I was reading this passage again this week, and I've heard all these passages multiple times I've taught them multiple times but it doesn't that seem like a weird way to end this right hey dude you know don't condemn people or you'll be condemned and the standard you use that standard will be used against you you reap what you sow right why are you noticing specks in everybody's eyes you got a tree coming out your head for crying out loud let's get rid of that first and you'll be able to see to help other people right and don't give dogs what is holy or pearls to pigs Like, if I'm in the audience, I'd have been like, how's that connect to this? (laughs) I don't have pearls, first of all, and if I did, I'm not throwing them to the pigs. Who would do that? He's using a figure of speech that was very common in that culture. They understood what he was saying. We're kind of separated from it. We don't get it. Here's what he's basically saying. Everything I just taught you, most people aren't going to do that. Most people are going to continue to condemn other people. And they're going to use a standard for judging other people that they don't want used against themselves. They're going to use an unreasonable standard that they don't want for themselves, but they want it for everybody else. That's how most everybody's going to do this. As in a few minutes, he's going to, well, not in a few minutes, but in a later teaching, he's going to say, uh, this, this kingdom thing that I'm talking about, it's a pretty narrow thing, and there's only going to be a few people who do it. So here's what he's saying. All that stuff I just taught you, there are going to be people who will refuse to do any of that and they will refuse to listen to the truth. Don't waste your time. You don't give dogs things that are holy. Well, some of you might. Some of you might be dog people. I don't know. Um, But you, you wouldn't, like, in this case, think about, like, the food in the temple, okay, in Jerusalem. There, were f- there was food that was put out that was holy to the Lord. There were 12 things of bread there. Uh, there was usually some fruit. There were some uh, animals being brought in that would be sacrificed, and this meat was holy to the Lord. You wouldn't dare take that in Jerusalem, ancient Jerusalem. You would not dare take that food in the temple and throw it to dogs, because dogs in this culture were not domesticated, they were not pets. I know on the Chosen show, Matthew has a dog. That was very, very uncommon in that culture. Right? So you you wouldn't go give holy food that's set apart for God to the dogs. And you wouldn't throw pearls into the pig pen, would you? What he's saying here is don't take something that's true and force it on people who don't want it. That's what he's saying. He's also going to call the the kingdom like a pearl of great price in one of his parables about the kingdom in Matthew 13. He says, man, the kingdom, it's like a precious pearl. So when he says this, we know what he's talking about. My way of life, this kingdom way of life that we're talking about here, it's like pearls. And if somebody doesn't want to listen to it, somebody doesn't want to live it out, they don't want to hear it, then don't force it on them. That's like throwing pearls into a pig pen. He's not calling people pigs and dogs. This was an illustration to say, don't take something this valuable and try to force it on people who don't want it. Do you know why pigs trample pearls? Because they don't care about pearls. 
They like mud and slop and food and water, right? They don't care about pearls, so they just step on them and drive them back into the mud, right? So he's saying, look, if somebody doesn't, they're just not interested in the things of God, they don't care what Jesus had to say, they don't want to do what Jesus said to do, then quit trying to force feed them. That's what this means. <laughs> but the crazy thing about this is the church has been doing the opposite of this for a long time. We're trying to force our message onto people who don't want to hear it. That doesn't mean we don't go preach the gospel. Man, we preach the gospel. We're commanded to do that. But if somebody says, I don't want to believe in your God, I don't want to believe in your Jesus, and I think Jesus was a bad teacher, I don't like his teachings, and I don't want to follow him, then we say, okay. And we go to the next person who might be willing to listen. So if I go to somebody in our church family with this passage and I say, you know what, you're, you're about to wreck your life. You are wrecking your life. Please let us help you out of this. And they say, I don't want to talk to you about this. I'm not going to talk to you about this. I don't want to listen to this. Then we follow the teachings of Jesus that he taught us in Matthew 18. We do what he said. And if they finally say, I don't want anything to do with your truth that you're trying to tell me, and we say, okay, fine. Please stop calling yourself a Christian. Because you're only hurting yourself. There's some other passages here. I'll just read them to you real quick. Uh, they help us understand what Jesus is saying here. He says, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. Fools don't want the pearl. Make sense? Proverbs 13, 19, a desire fulfilled is sweet to the soul, but to turn away from evil is an abomination to fools. To turn away from your sin is like sin to them because they're a fool. They're being foolish. So to repent seems stupid to them. Proverbs 14, 7, leave the presence of a fool. <laughs> For there you do not meet with words of knowledge. <laughs> I like that passage. I don't know why. It's like God said, hey, you know some fools? Don't hang out with them. Right? Proverbs 17.10. A rebuke goes deeper into a man of understanding than a hundred blows into a fool. A man of understanding will gladly take correction. And it will go deep into them and they will evaluate themselves and they will think and pray hard on what you've told them. They will really think this through and work on it. That's what a person of wisdom and understanding will do. But a fool, you could beat him half to death and he's still going to go do the same thing. Right? Some of you are thinking of your kids right now. Don't do that. <laughs> I just beat them and beat them. They keep doing the same thing. <laughs> That was for the people online, not anybody in here. All right. Proverbs 18.2, a fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. Put that in your pipe, not smoke it, right? Only, fools just love telling you what they think. Hmm. So if you love telling people, if you love speaking your mind, Proverbs says you're dumb. <laughs> Read Proverbs 9 on your free time. You'll love it. Proverbs 23, 9. Do not speak in the hearing of a fool, for he will despise the good sense of your words. Sound familiar? If you keep trying to tell a fool the truth, they're just going to hate you more. Quit throwing your pearls in the pig pen. <laughs> Proverbs 26, 4. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him yourself. You know what that means? If you keep trying to correct a fool, you are one. <laughs> it's foolish to keep trying to correct a fool. Proverbs 23, uh, 29, 9. If a wise man has an argument with a fool, the fool only rages and laughs, and there is no quiet. Now stare at that while I read this again. If a wise man has an argument with a fool, 
The fool only rages and laughs, and there is no quiet. Hmm. They'll just turn and attack you. People who hate truth attack it violently. I think we all know that's true. So be careful who you give your truth to. So let's review. Those who condemn others will be condemned. Focus on your own sin before you try to help others out of their sin. You might have a bigger sin and coming out of your eye than the sawdust you're seeing in theirs. And don't force truth on people who don't want it. Pretty simple. All of Jesus' teachings are pretty simple. Just not always easy to live out. But it's not because it's actually hard. It's because we're making it hard. So here's what I think we should do to end our time together. We've got communion here. I think we've got enough in the basket for all of us. Surely there's only, what, ten of us here. <laughs> so, um, What I think we ought to do with this is let's take a minute. Let's sing together. Let's pray. Let's pray for those who may be caught up in something. But let's pray for ourselves that God would show us the log in our own eye. Because that's how to come at this with the right heart. God, is there something I'm not seeing in myself before I even attempt to try to help somebody with their issue? Maybe we need to pray, God, help us, help us to stop paying so much attention to everybody else's issues. Because here's what we know about that. If you focus on your own issues, you'll have a full-time job. See, I, I'm, not, I'm not looking around to everybody else to see if I can find something they're doing wrong. First of all, I'd rather not even know, <laughs> right? Because then it means if we're in the family together, that means i got to go help you, <laughs> right? I want to deal with me. I want the Spirit to take over in my life and force out those things that shouldn't be in, inside of me. That's what I'm working on. And if in that process someone needs help, then I'm going to go with the attitude that I'm just as messed up as you. And if, it, if I had the same circumstances, the same life experiences, and the same weakness you do, I'd be doing the same thing you are. But let's not walk off a cliff. I want to pull you back from the edge so we can have life and have it more abundantly together. So let's pray that God would deal with our own stuff and that he give us the wisdom and understanding and the patience and the mercy and compassion for his other kids who may be messing up. Let's pray together. Oh.